mini series for anybody that follows my channel they know i don't just do a quick three minute video i give you the in-depth i you know i'm giving the giving you the 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 idea of thinking about it differently so this professor guy from guess what university i think it was of toronto um so you know uh he's sitting there saying that oh the aerial arrow was a complete failure okay there was a guy who proposed in 2012 that we go over the plans on this and see if it is feasible to resurrect this thing not in its form like this 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 is this is outdated you know but the airframe you know most of the study and research and development a lot of that stuff is still around like i mean uh, it was ordered destroyed so the soviets wouldn't get a hold of the technology but the the thing is this is that a lot of a lot of people took the plans home you know <laughs> you know people kept souvenirs so to speak and the surviving records uh, i mean we could always dredge lake ontario and see if we can find the rest of the parts <laughs> you know they have found parts of lake ontario from the arrow program um you know, because that's where they dumped a lot of stuff. Uh, you couldn't do that now. Uh, and then the rest of it got turned into pots and pans. They must have been really nice pots and pans because they, they use some pretty extraordinary materials for this airplane for the day. Uh, you know, magnesium alloys and stuff like that. This, this was not, you know, when we look at it now, we don't realize the amount of effort when it, that went into this airplane. And this is the stuff that that professor, you know, he's, I'll tell you what he said first. Um, first off, he's saying that, Okay, it was over budget. Yes, there was mismanagement. I agree with you with that. If the, the, the company had been run a bit better, I still think the airplanes would have flown on the same amount of time, but they probably would have done it on a little bit less money. Was it over budget? Yes. The, the comp and Avro was not used to staying under budget. That's why they went out of business. Again, management. But now let's get onto the ground floor where the airplane was built. Well, hey, this was pretty well organized. They tested every single aspect of the airplane before they built it, meaning there was no prototype it was right into manufacturing okay now when did the this is uh, they also said if they were to put it head to head with the uh, you know uh, you know head to head with the um, f-35 if it were to leave from vancouver uh the f-35 would make it to about winnipeg uh you know and the arrow if it left from vancouver it would make it to almost toronto at you know in the same amount of time because it cruises almost twice as fast okay so um he says no he says uh from uh, ottawa to hamilton in nine minutes he says uh if you go past you know like they say the movie you got to understand the movie does you know add a lot of bs in there you know there's a lot of things that the airplane didn't do but they're you know they, they're building it up right they're they're, they're you know they're, they're giving it a, a good i mean the airplane did have malfunctions but not very many uh most of it was landing gear related like the landing gear doors so like stuff like that would have been refined you know what i mean they, they would have worked that out eventually um the thing is is that he said okay it only had a 600 mile range actually the the, the first arrow only really had about that or less three four hundred mile range as an interceptor meaning get off the ground as fast as you can uh, a complete scramble get up to fifty thousand feet you burned up all your fuel but in economy cruise probably about 600 mile range you know on about uh, that's almost five times the fuel capacity too but this is in 1958 okay uh the the later arrows had a much longer range and apparently this guy should have his teaching license pulled and i'll tell you why because i guess he never heard of drop tanks <laughs> that would have increased the range as well um but the later variants when the the arenda engines were ready uh you know the engines were lighter and they were way more powerful um this thing did accomplish quite a bit for the day even to today's standards uh the guy who's proposing who was proposing that the harper government look at they, they the harper government looked at it and said you know okay this guy's probably just living in fantasy land this guy also said you know to be honest with you look i thought it was candid camera uh coming to my door saying you want to you know yeah right you want to get the arrow going i could take one look at it, this airplane and tell you that with modern technology modern engines modern avionics this thing would not only be low maintenance because it has a stable airframe, uh, has a high aspect ratio, it's going to cruise really fast, okay? If you make it lighter, it's going to climb really, it already did climb really fast. <laughs> this thing was a homesick angel. And not only that, with more uh, advanced engines, this thing is going to have range like you wouldn't believe. It's exactly what Canada needs. It's funny how an airplane that was designed for Canada is exactly what Canada needs now. Hmm, imagine that. But I guess this professor just couldn't really see this. Did it, you know...
You know, because he's looking at, most people look at the airplane as a budget. Okay, forget the budget. Yes, the budget was blown. We know that. But, okay, when did we start the uh, F-35 in what, 1995, 99? You know, when did the construction, you know, when, when did that happen? 1998? Okay, well, even, even so, okay, there's f- a few flying versions of the F-35. Okay, they're not in service yet, to my knowledge. They're, they're not in service. And even if they were, there's only a handful of them. You know, they're just way too expensive. The proposal was that if they built this, they could build it for $12 billion over 20 years, and the uh, F-35 is going to be like $26 billion at the same amount of time. We get more airplane for the money that can do more things. The only advantage that I'd give to the uh, to the uh, F-35 is going to be VSTAL, because you put the right radar on there, you could detect stealth, <laughs> you know, I mean, the anti-stealth technology, again, it, it's, it's an obsolete, unless they come up with a new, I mean, you can make the airplane stealthier in look, but, I mean, this thing had a lot of wing area, you know, and again, you'd think the professor would pick up on this, this thing has the exact same wing area, or slightly more than that is an SU-27, so, if we grab the, the engines out of the SU-27, this thing suddenly gets a phenomenal range of 2,700 miles, or even more, because it's probably even more aerodynamic. Uh, I mean, this thing had like virtually no drag. That's why the cockpit's the shape it is. You know, they made they made it work. You know what I mean? To be as drag free as possible. So let's talk about some other things. I I don't know how this man can call this thing a failure. Other than if you look at the flight logs, there was sixty five flights in total. Okay, there was a few there was uh, a few landing gear mishaps. One where uh, the air, the airplane actually uh, you know the, the doors didn't open and it belly landed. The other one it ripped the landing gear off. Uh, next to that, uh, sometimes the nose door uh, for the landing gear wouldn't close. Uh, stuff like that. That's about the, uh, the... There was very little failures on this airplane because it was designed so incredibly well. Uh, again, it went from drawings to, to manufacture. There was no prototype. And comparing what I just said about the, uh, what, 15 or 20 years at the uh, almost uh, well, at least 15 years that the F-35 has been in development. This thing was flying, okay, with almost the same amount of variance as the F-35 is now in four years. I think that's quite successful. <laughs> you know, considering there was no prototype, it was right to manufacturing. Now you could argue, okay, well they became prototypes because they changed the design as they went, but they had all the jigging and tool. They just had to tweak it, right? So it wasn't really. Uh, a, a prototype. It wasn't, okay, this is, I mean, if you look at the uh, T-10, which was the SU-27's prototype, it looks nothing real. it looks similar to the, the SU-27, but it doesn't look like it at all. They're, they're different. If you look at the uh, YF-17, which was the uh, FA-18, or, you know, it, it looks similar, but there's, a, you can distinctly tell they're different aircraft. You know, one's a design concept, you know, to just see if it'll fly, the other one is, you know, the production. Well, this thing was production. You know, so this this university guy, I, I don't see where he think. Oh, people over romanticize it. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, people think, oh, it'll fly again because it. But he's thinking of it in this version. You know, again, I've made the the cross reference with the Russians. Uh, they start the Su twenty seven to the Su thirty five. There's almost nothing, you know, that they share in common. They're completely different airplanes. But the design goes back to the Su twenty seven. Well, the arrow. We put a bubble canopy on that. We solve a lot of problems. We put a, a 25 millimeter cannon in the nose, mounted exactly like the CF-18, right where it should be. Uh, let's say your uh, HUD goes out. You know, as long as the cannon works, you can still you know put a little dot on the the windscreen and say, okay, well, if anything's on that dot, you can just squeeze the trigger and blast it away within X Y Z. You know, World War II style, but it, you can make low tech, high tech. You need both. Um, change these nacelles a bit. You got a Mach 3 interceptor. Bombay's well. There, there's, you know, that's what gives you a lot of extra mileage. You could put fuel in there if you wanted. Uh, you could attach hard points on the wings. You can attach hard points along the body, or you could put everything internal and keep it nice and clean and get the range and make a patrol aircraft. Uh, what happens if uh, we put uh, CF-18 engines in there, which are about twenty-six thousand pounds thrust? The Arenda engine, I think, was about the same, about twenty-six thousand. Some say thirty. Again, what was it tweaked to? What variant? You know, like I mean, at, at what time? I mean, the airplane got tweaked quite a bit. You know. Um, at 30,000 pounds thrust, you know, this thing, you know, at best it had with a drop tank about 1200 mile range. That's not bad, but that's the same as the F-18, but the performance difference between this and the CF-18, well, it's night and day. This thing was a throw. This thing was, uh, very, very fast. It was a go fast airplane. It might not, there's no way it would turn with a CF-18. The CF-18, 
uh, to me, can outfly the F-35, you know, uh, especially the CF-18. The FA-18 and the CF-18 are not the same airplane. Canada has taken the CF-18. We built it here under contract, but we also changed the design a bit to suit Canada a bit better. The problem with the CF-18 is it's just too small. <laughs> you know, you can't put everything in it that you need. Uh, you know, so things are hanging off the airplane, uh, you know, stuff like that. But the airplane does everything. It's an awesome workhorse of an airplane. It has a great roll rate. It's very snappy. Uh, does excellent down low. Does not too bad up high. It doesn't do as high as well uh, uh, as well up high as the F-15, but it does better down low than the F-15. It doesn't do as well down low as the F-16, but it does better up high. So the uh, CF-18 is kind of the, you know, that, that, you know, in the middle airplane. But just the design of the CF-18 is still to be beat in a lot of ways. You know, because you could take that original concept and do like what the Russians do. Now, the Americans kind of did that with the Super Hornet. Uh, Super Hornet, I, I would probably put it as a, a contender, but I think the SU-35 would be better for Canada than the Super Hornet. Why? The range. Uh, the weapons load. Uh, it's a bigger airplane. Canada's a big country. We're going to need a big airplane. Dimensionally, this is about the same size, a slightly bit bigger than that as an SU-27. Now... For this guy who said, uh, you know, this this so-called professor who said, uh, no, this it's a pipe dream to, you know, this thing is, you know, it was a failure. It wasn't a failure. That's why it never got off the ground, so to speak. Uh, that would have, this thing, if we would have exported it, everybody would have bought it. Oh, there were no orders. There were, eh, I don't know about that. Because in the aero, aero uh, space engineering, the designers were basically just like, oh my, you know, if the if this thing was such a blunder, Okay, half the staff wouldn't have got scooped up by NASA. NASA knew what they built. <laughs> you know, they knew what they built. They're like, uh, we need those guys. And look at how NASA flourished after. Hmm, I wonder how they got to the moon. Yeah, there was a lot of Canadians that worked on that. That worked on that. <laughs> you know, th these are things in history that you know uh, people. You know, they had to. You know, they canceled an excellent airplane. They had to. Uh, you know, they had to make it sound like it was a piece of junk. You know. But it wasn't by that day's standards. Today's standards, again, it wouldn't hold up because the technology is way outdated. But the airframe is still a thoroughbred. It don't matter what, you know, it's a Buck Rogers airplane no matter how you do it. So I'm going to start talking about some numbers in the next video. Okay, so this is the second part. I, I, I do mini series. For anybody that follows my channel, they know I don't just do a quick three-minute video. I give you the in-depth. You know, I'm giving, the, giving you the, the, the idea of thinking about it differently. So this professor guy from, guess what, university, I think it was of Toronto. Um, so, you know, uh, he's sitting there saying that, oh, the aerial arrow was a complete failure. Okay. There was a guy who proposed in 2012 that we go over the plans on this and see if it is feasible to resurrect this thing. Not in its form like this. This, this, is, this is outdated, you know. But the airframe, you know, most of the study and research and development a lot of that stuff is still around. Like, I mean, uh, it was ordered, destroyed, so the Soviets wouldn't get a hold of the technology. But the the thing is, this is that a lot of a lot of people took the plans home. You know, <laughs> you know, people kept souvenirs, so to speak. And the surviving records. Uh, I mean, we could always dredge Lake Ontario and see if we could find the rest of the parts. <laughs> you know, they have found parts of Lake Ontario from the Aero program. Um, you know, because that's where they dumped a lot of stuff. Uh, you couldn't do that now. Uh, and then the rest of it got turned into pots and pans. They must have been really nice pots and pans because they, they used some pretty extraordinary materials for this airplane for the day. Uh, you know, magnesium alloys and stuff like that. Th this was not, you know, when we look at it now, we don't realize the amount of effort went in, that went into this airplane. And this is the stuff that that professor, you know, he's, I'll tell you what he said first. Um, first off, he's saying that, Okay, it was over budget. Yes, there was mismanagement. I agree with you with that. If the, the, the company had been run a bit better, I still think the airplanes would have flown on the same amount of time, but they probably would have done it on a little bit less money. Was it over budget? Yes. The, the comp and Avro 